Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This time, my colleague Graham Dumbleton from Down Under is going to be talking to us about deploying Jupyter Hub on OpenShift. And we're really thrilled to have Graham um, doing this because um, many of you are using Jupyter Notebooks. Um, a lot of you are um, using data science workloads and ML workloads on OpenShift and testing this, the waters out in this. And we think that Jupyter Hub is a great project. and I'm thrilled to have um, this backgrounder on what to do at what Jupyter Notebooks are and what Jupyter Hubs is um, by one of my um, compatriots. Um, so Graham, I'm going to let you take it away and introduce yourself and we'll get running here. Okay, thanks Diane. Um, so yeah, I'm Graham Dublin as uh, Diane says. So I'm actually based in Sydney in Australia. Um, my background is as a Python developer f um, from a long, long, long way back. And I have a particular interest in the problem of deploying uh, web applications or services to make them available on the internet. Um, and Jupyter has been one of these ones which has always intrigued me. I'm, I'm not actually a user of the Jupyter uh, notebooks and products myself, but I, I like playing with them as a technical challenge to work out how to get them working or how to get them working well in a uh, platform as a service type environment. Uh, the purpose of this talk today is to talk a little bit about what Jupyter Notebooks are uh, and how you can get them deployed in different ways on your own uh, box as a software as a service or self-hosted option and then talk about how you could run these things up on uh, OpenShift rather than trying to do it all yourself. So Jupyter, uh, if you're already watching this, you're probably well aware of what it is, but it's a interactive in web environment you can get in and work on documents which can include text, uh, media, code, and that code can be used to actually pull down data, analyze it, chop it up in bits and pieces, and then present it in a, in a graphical form so you can look at it and it can be charting and so on. Uh, people who are interested in using Jupyter Notebooks, uh, you have individuals who use it for self-teaching. Uh, so there are various notebooks out there, especially in the Python space for learning about Python, for example. Uh, it can be used by a team of people uh, in an organization who work together in analyzing data from their organization and trying to get value from that. Um, one example is in financial um, institutions where they might use Jupyter Notebooks as a way of analyzing stock trading data from a previous day to actually try and work out new algorithms for their trading system. And finally, it can be used in teaching environments. Uh, so if you have a, a large class of students who themselves are learning about um, data analytics, then you can use Jupyter Notebook as a mechanism for teaching them. One of the uh, cutest uh, use cases or uses I've ever come across for Jupyter Notebooks was actually one from Singapore, and I, I love visiting Singapore, so that's why it's a bit of a favourite. Uh, Singapore has a very good uh, public transport system, uh, but one of the uh, rail lines they have there, or underground lines, the trains would keep stopping, uh, and they didn't quite know why. And they managed to accumulate all this different data about where all the stoppages were, uh, which train it was, what time of day, and so on. And they had a team there who took that data and put it into a Jupyter Notebook and started trying to analyze it. And it was a really interesting use case. What they found was that it wasn't caused by, it wasn't one particular train that was always stopping. The locations were appearing to be random, different times of the day, and it was a tough nut to, to work out. But eventually they used Jupyter Notebooks to actually work out what was going on. And it was actually caused by one single train. As it passed around the network, that one train never stopped. But whenever it passed a train in another tunnel, the interference from that one train could interfere with electronics of the other one, cause the other one to stop. So this is a sort of example where you can take data, get it into a Jupyter notebook, and do arbitrary analysis on it, and present that data and come to a conclusion of, of what's going on. So it can be really good in a, in a company environment where you don't have existing applications to work with your data, and you do want to do things piecemeal. Now, the topic of this talk is, is not just Jupyter Notebooks, it's also this thing called Jupyter Hub. And this particular comes into play when we talk about a teaching environment, but also can be inside an organization where you have a small team. Jupyter Hub is a means of running up instances of Jupyter Notebooks uh, 
in an environment where users can just log into Jupyter Hub and they'll be given an instance of Jupyter Notebooks that they can use. That may be an empty notebook or pre-populated with data and uh, their notebook files. Now, why that is important, we'll, we'll see in a moment as we go through and look at how all the problems and issues that come up when you actually try and deploy Jupyter Notebooks yourself. Uh, so, with the Jupyter Hub, one last point on Jupyter Hub to um, to point out is that it is actually going to give each person an individual Jupyter notebook themselves to work with, and and that is handled out of Jupyter Hub with uh, this thing called the Spawner component, and that can actually be deployed in a lot of different ways, be it on a one single host or spawned out onto multiple hosts, uh, or even using a, a system like Kubernetes to spawn that out. And obviously, Kubernetes is used in OpenShift, and, and why we could, this is of interest to us. So getting started with Jupyter Notebooks by themselves. If you're going to do this on your own box as an individual, uh, then if you've got Python installed on your computer, then to get a Jupyter Notebook up and running, it's a simple case of going using the PIP package manager from Python to install Jupyter, and then you can run it. And you get yourself an empty notebook, and you can start working in that. You can upload your notebook files into it through the web interface, uh, or if you run up the Jupyter Notebook inside a directory which already has those notebooks, they'll be already visible in there. And once you have that, you can then click on any of the notebook files you have, and you'll get your actual interactive notebook where you can start working away. If you need additional Python packages, which is pretty well going to be always the case, because uh, you want all these packages that exist out there for Python, such as NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, and many, many others. And, and that is one of the reasons why Jupyter Notebooks are so attractive. Uh, Python, if you want to do something, there's generally a package out there for doing it. Uh, and they're easy to get installed. But you do need to install them, uh, and you can get a terminal up inside of Jupyter Notebooks to actually install the extra packages you need in your notebooks. So running Jupyter Notebooks locally, why are they good? You are working in your local computer, so it means that all your work is saved locally. You don't have to worry about how you're going to back these things up. Just as long as you've got your own computer backed up, you're fine. Uh, you can make the decision about what version of Python you want to use, what distribution of Python, uh, and get the packages you installed in there. And th they'll be there once you install them and um, between runs of notebooks. Why running Jupyter Notebooks is not so good on your own? Uh, computer system is that if you want to then share your notebooks with other people, you relying on the other person to be able to duplicate the same environment that you are running. So they may very well need the same operating system. They'll need to have the same Python distribution and version. And when we talk about different Python distributions, there is the, the main one from the Python Software Foundation, uh, which is CPython, and there's also the Anaconda Python distribution. Now they have different package indexes for downloading packages, and those package indexes aren't quite the same as well, so you can run into differences there. But overall, trying to do it yourself on your own box from scratch can be a lot of effort to set up and maintain. So what's the next option? The next option you can use is to run Docker uh, on your own computer. Now Docker provides a means of running applications inside what's called a container, uh, and it isolates that container uh, from other uh, applications to running on your box. But more importantly, what you get with uh, Docker is the ability to bring in an image file which contains all the bits and pieces you need to run your application already in it. So the Jupyter Project people make available a whole bunch of Jupyter Notebook images. Uh, a minimal notebook one is just a Jupyter Notebook. But they have one called SciPy Notebook, which has pre-installed in it a whole bunch of different packages suitable for data analytics. So NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, and lots, lots more. The, the SciPy notebook uh, and some of the other ones that derive from it also have the option of, of being able to use Python 2 or Python 3. So it gives you that flexibility and choice uh, to do it, use them. So it can be a great way of starting up notebooks very, very quickly. You just need to, as long as you've got Docker running, you can pull down that Docker image, start it up, and you've got an environment without doing too much extra work. And that's just by done, done by running Docker run command. So that's good because it comes with everything you need. Uh, it's a particular Python distribution. So if you want to have someone else use your notebooks, then you just need to say, go run this Docker image, and you're off to go, good and off to go. Uh, these images are read only, which means that it's, you can't really destroy them. You can't muck them up, because once you stop them, 
uh, they will you lose all the work that you've done inside of them. Uh, but it means you can't wreck them up, run them up again. The next time it will be back to where it was before. Uh, it's a nice safe environment, so you've got no problems with it to interfering with other things. And you don't need to maintain these things because people are providing them through the Jupyter Pro book so you can use them. These Docker images are harder to customize and make, uh, though if you want to add in additional packages, uh, you either have to create your own Docker image, uh, which derives from it and adds the extra bits, or every time you start up, you're going to have to install those extra packages. These packages can be very large. If you're on a really slow internet connection like everyone in Australia, uh, then you're going to have a problem pulling these images down. Some of those images are 1.5 gigabytes in size, and I wait a long time to pull them down over our, our really slow internet here. Uh, and that is because they might have multiple, multiple Python versions in there. They can have all these different packages that you don't really need in there. Uh, so yeah, it can be a problem. Um, because these images, when you run them up, run in a container, it doesn't mean they're isolated, but that means also that all your work is lost when you, you stop it. It means you have to do have to fiddle around with trying to mount volumes into the Docker image so that your work is going to be written back into your local computer can be saved away. Otherwise, you have to configure the Jupyter Notebook to use a custom contents manager and store those files elsewhere, such as on S3 or Google Docs and so on. And one last issue with Docker images always you have to be concerned about is that when you start them up, is the access to them secure enough? Because you're starting up a web server from this uh, Docker image, if that web application becomes exposed outside of your box and you don't secure it properly so only you can access it, then it means that people can get into that notebook uh, instance from outside of your box and potentially do things with your work. So what other options have we got if we can't, we don't want to run on our own system then? And this is where we can start to look at uh, software as a service or hosted options. Now one popular way of very quickly uh, having a look at notebook if you've just got a notebook off the internet, you want to have a quick look at is thing called TempNB. This is a, a project which is uh, done by the Jupyter Project people uh, and hosted up on Rackspace. You can go here and what will happen is that as soon as you hit the page there, it will give you an instance of a Jupyter notebook. Now, because they can't know in advance what you may need, it's a very, very, very fat image. Uh, so it has multiple Python versions or, or different language versions, Python, Ruby, uh, Haskell, uh, R, uh, and for the different language runtimes, it may have a whole lot of uh, packages which are pre-installed. But it does give you a way of very quickly getting up a notebook running. But that is all ephemeral. After a while, it will go away, you'll lose all your work. So great for looking at something read-only, not great if you want to actually use it for developing a notebook and working in it. The next option is to go look at uh, people like uh, as, uh, Microsoft and Google and the uh, services they provide. And, and these aren't the only ones available. There are others. Uh, this is a place where you can create an account with these people. You get in there, you get your own little space where you can work in. And usually they would have integration with their storage system so that automatically when you save work, it's saved away and is backed up by them. Uh, so they're the two main options you'll find for those. Now, these are really good because someone else is looking after them for you. you. You don't have to set them up yourself. And they are designed for use by multiple users. So um, my understanding is that you can, with these, save your, your work away. And have, you do have the ability to have someone else log into that system as well. And you can share your notebook with them uh, through the system, as I understand it. Why these are not quite so good, though, is they are still a shared resource. Um, like multiple different people are going to get in there. So you don't have any visibility of how the system is implemented underneath. Uh, and one would hope that they are all secured so that your own little work is separate, but you are compared, potentially competing for resources on the one system. Uh, the whole system is, is potentially out of your control. Uh, you don't know how reliable it is. You're relying on them to actually just keep a system that's working. And you probably have a limited ability to customize it or diff, uh, limited ability to select which versions of software you want to use with it. Being a system run by someone else and not on your own premise, you have to worry about information security. Obviously, this is not something a bank is going to use if you want to work with uh, share trading information or other confidential information uh, from your customers. Um, and finally, uh, there is a concern here, a bit of vendor lock-in. Um, these services also have a free tier. And, and what they're relying on is they're using open source software as an on-ramp for you to use their other paid services. 
So you may want a database product uh, to store all your data in. So they'll quite happily start uh, selling that to you. It then means you are started locked into their architecture. It's a bit harder to move off. So what about self-hosting? Uh, this is where you run it on your own, your own uh, machine. Now, this is what you're doing with Jupyter Notebook uh, directly when you install it. But in this case, what we want to look at is how you can install a system which can be used by multiple users at the same time and not just yourself. Uh, and the, the main, main option here is, is a project called Jupyter Hub. Uh, and that again is from the Jupyter project team. This provides a system where you can log into it and you'll get a Jupyter Notebook instance to play with. Now, this is essentially very, very similar to uh, what Tempimb is set up. Tempimb is actually a separate project, but it's actually simple to create a version of Tempimb using Jupyter Hub. You just need to disable the authentication. You'll see how I do that later. Um, so you can install this as open source software, so you can custom it however you want, uh, modify it for your particular way you want to do it, set up it to use um, your particular authentication mechanism uh, using your organization. Uh, you can use it to set up so that when you run up your notebooks, they have persistent storage and, and so on, or use your custom images. And there are many, many deployment options. You can, you can create one big machine and run everything on the one machine, uh, but will be limited, therefore, by how many things you can run. Or you can actually start to farm out the notebook instances across machines in a cloud-like environment. Uh, because you're running this yourself, um, you do have to set it up from scratch. Uh, you're going to have to dedicate infrastructure to it usually uh, because you're going to take over those machines just to run this. And there's a lot of effort there to setting up, uh, setting it up and keeping it running. And that's okay if you've got a IT department, uh, but if you don't have an IT department there who's going to do all this work for you, you have to do it yourself. You've then become an IT operations uh, department of your own, which is, may not be what you really want to be doing. The next one uh, is Binder. Now, this actually is really a software as a service. Uh, again, it's, it's something that you can actually go out onto the internet. You can go to the uh, mybinder.org and give it a URL for a repository which contains the notebooks you want to use. So this works actually a little bit different to the Tempen B service in that Tempen B will just give you a, a, an empty workspace with, or with a whole lot of stuff pre-installed. Binder allows you to actually give it a repository and it will build for you on the fly an image which incorporates all of your notebooks that you want to actually work with and also install all the different Python packages that you want uh, to be installed, which you need in your, your notebook. Uh, so it might take a little bit of time the first time it does that because it does need to build that image um, and get up. But this is something where you can go on to, uh, to mybind.org and use that uh, and it'll give you that ability. Now, the reason I've dropped in here and self-hosted is that underneath it's actually using a project called Binder Hub and also Jupyter Hub. Uh, it also actually uh, relies on a whole, a whole bunch of others, including uh, Kubernetes, Helm, and all these other bits and pieces under the covers. Uh, so you can go to there, get down the Binder Hub software, and you can start to install it yourself. Now, it is going to be a lot of work, um, but it gives you that, that capability to do it. Now, Binder Cell Service, again, because it is a, a, a software as a service, you, you, you have an ability to customize the image because it can take the contents of a Git repository and build it into an image for you now. But it's still a service that's owned by someone else. Uh, so you have all those all the problems you had before with information security. It's a shared service. How reliable is it and so on? You can install it yourself because it is open source software. Um, but again, it can be complicated to set up. Uh, you have to ensure that in, in an environment, even in your own organization, you set up all the authentication security correctly. Now, one of the things with Binder Hub, when I look at it, is that, well, isn't this reinventing a pass? Uh, if you think about what a platform as a service is, it's the idea that you can have a Git repository somewhere which has a whole bunch of source code in it for your application, and you can tell that platform as a service, here's my source code, you go build it into a image or some other format for me and get it up and running for me, and I don't really care. Now that's what Binder Hub is doing. Uh, and it's doing that by essentially taking a whole bunch of other components such as Kubernetes and adding in uh, components, own, components of its own like Binder Hub, uh, Repo to Docker and all these other bits to invent its own pass. Um, why is that a problem? Well, we have passes and that's what OpenShift is. Uh, so let's have a look at 
how we could do things instead with running Jupyter on OpenShift. Uh, so OpenShift itself is a pass, as I mentioned, um, and it's actually more than a pass. It's also what's called a container as a service or CAS. So you can take an existing container image and you can get it up and running OpenShift, or you can tell it here is the source code and build it in pass style and get it up and running as well. Uh, so I can, for example, if I have a notebook image for Jupyter, I, it's very, very simple to get that up and running. And I don't have to do any extra work. Uh, I can just log into my existing OpenShift instance and say, here is my image, which I might have up on Docker Hub, and you can get it up and running. And I haven't had to do any extra work. As long as you've got the quota and resources and the account uh, with it, you can log in your existing account and get it up and running and it'll all go. Um, now we all see, you can do that, but we want to make this somewhat easier. Now we can do this through templates. Now in the case of Binder Hub, it was using Kubernetes and using a template system called Helm to do it. Now Helm is not necessarily the simplest thing to work with uh, and can require admin rights to actually get it installed and running. So getting it running in OpenShift is not necessarily a simple task. Uh, but OpenShift does have a simple template mechanism itself. And I've got a whole bunch of templates here, which I've written, which allows me to do different things. So I can install a Jupyter notebook from an existing image. I can already be using the existing capabilities of OpenShift, uh, build up my image from a repository containing all my notebooks and packages I want list, which are all the packages I want installed. And I can do all that for this very simple template. So I can just click on it and I, it's very simple to get them up and loaded. But I can do the same thing with JupyterHub. I can install JupyterHub and say, run it with an uh, existing Jupyter, Jupyter notebook image, or I can actually say, go and build me a new Jupyter notebook image and get it up and running. So building a customized notebook image, um, very, very simple. You just click on the template. So you, you can say what the base image you want to build from, and you give it a, a Git repository. And away I'll go build that image and get it up and running. Uh, and that is using this thing called source to image in OpenShift. That is that capability of taking that Git repository running it through this builder image. And in this case, I've got a builder image I've built up to specifically create images for Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, and it will then go off and deploy it. Uh, no Jupyter Hub deployment, similar thing. I can very quickly click on the tem template, give it the notebook image I've already created and get it deployed. So show that in action and show how simple it is. Uh, I'll do a quick demo uh, and then we'll uh, wrap up and um, we'll see whether Diane's got any questions or anyone else has joined in. So I have got a completely blank um, OpenShift account. So this is if I had access to my existing OpenShift account inside of an organization um, and I've, you know, totally empty. I'm not admin or anything. I don't need to do any, any special access to do this. So if I need to start off and get things going, then I only need to do a couple of things here. Now, the first thing for extra security reasons, I'm going to, um, let me just make this a little bit bigger create a service, special service account, which I'm going to run JupyterHub under in particular. JupyterHub needs to be able to run up extra notebook instances. And this service account is just going to allow me to, to do that uh, by giving it access to the API of OpenShift to be able to create things. So I've created a service account. And all I have to now do is I've got a uh, set of resources which define all of my templates, but it's also going to go off and build me all my images. So if I jump back to my user interface now, I can go in here and see it's going to go off and build all those. And that'll take a, a, a few minutes, so I'm not going to hang around for it. I, I've got some uh, already pre-done. So I, I go over to my other demo there. So they've already built there. Uh, the, the quick ones took a, a minute and a half. The longer ones took a bit longer. The, one, the bottom ones are SciPy Notebook and TensorFlow Notebook. So I'm emulating what Jupyter Project does there and creating some notebook images, which have a whole lot of stuff pre-installed, uh, which you can use. But I want to actually uh, deploy that now. So if I want to deploy it, uh, I just go to my catalog, search up for my templates for JupyterHub, and I can uh, just deploy a notebook. I'm going to just deploy a minimal notebook. I'll give it a password so it has a bit of security in there and that's enforced by the template. And that's going to run up an instance of my notebook. Uh, so very quickly, I've gone from having OpenShift with nothing in it, a normal account, and I've, I've got my uh, notebook image up and running. 
And I'm using a soft science certificate here, so I'll just have to accept that. And it's going to come up. And that's all fairly quick. So a few, few minutes there to get things running. So in under five minutes, I can be up and running. Uh, now that's an empty one, so that's a bit boring. Uh, so what we can do instead, we can go back to our catalog and I can obviously build up an image from a uh, repository. So what I'll do this time is rather than actually build a notebook image, I'm going to go straight onto JupyterHub. So if I go to JupyterHub and I want to do a quick start version, I'm just going to start up a version of JupyterHub. I'm going to get the Git repository URL for a set of notebooks already and I'm going to get Jake Vanderplus's uh, excellent set of notebooks for his book. And I'm going to just drop that in there as a URL. I don't need to touch anything else. Going to start deploying JupyterHub. And at the same time as doing that, it's going to start building that custom image that I want, which has all of Jake's work in. And again, that'll take a few minutes. So we'll skip that and go straight to a running instance. So here's the one I already have running. Uh, and this time I've got a little custom URL on it. So if you are uh, on the call and have a, a web browser handy, you can go to this address, tempmb.getwarp.org on HTTPS, uh, and it will get you into the Jupyter notebook. So I'm going to do that. And it's going to start me up an instance. So if I drop back to the web console, you can see how it's already started me up I, my own Jupyter notebook instance. Uh, and then anyone who comes into this, now I've set this up like tempnb, so there is no password. But anyone who could come into this address would get their own instance of a, uh, a notebook. And in this case, it has all of those notebooks from Jake's wonderful book. And I can just go in here and select one, run it up, and off, I'm off and going. And we'll see if there's anyone else. No one else has dropped on, so that's okay. And I obviously then could just run this, you know, run through all my cells, work on that, and do everything I would normally need to do. So that was very, very quickly, both getting a Jupyter notebook running, um, but also a building an image from custom repository files, or even just running up Jupyter Hub. Uh, and for me, that is a much simpler way than doing it than going and often using uh, JupyterHub Direct. JupyterHub does have the ability to work with Kubernetes. So that means you have to set up Kubernetes. You have to actually work out how to configure it all. But here, with for OpenShift, I provide a very nice, simple template where you can just drop in the template and you're going straight away. So that was a very quick demo. Um, so just to, to look then why, what the benefits are of using OpenShift for Jupyter, um, why I think it's probably a better option if you already have uh, OpenShift available. And, and that is that it's much more accessible to you know, developers and non-technical users. I don't need to be an IT operations person here. If I have an OpenShift account in an instance already, uh, then as long as I have the quota to be able to set up the size of Jupyter Hub instance that I already that I want for the number of users I need, I can install it without any uh, any help from IT operations people. Um, I still have the ability to to customize that deployment. The, the way that the templates are set up is that you can drop in uh, a custom JupyterHub config file and through the template, or you could even actually have it in a repository and itself use the source to image mechanism to build up a custom JupyterHub image which has the custom configuration so that you can set up your authentication, uh, your requirements for persistent storage and so on. You can set all those up. Uh, so it's not a fixed way of doing things. It's not like a software as a service. There's still a great level of customization you can do in there. Uh, and because it's simple to do, and I'll provide, I will be down the track, provide all the instructions and documentation on the site for, for doing all this. I think it's a good choice for uh, collaborators in a company or even uh, people in education where they might have an OpenShift instance already in that institution, uh, they can get access to it and start working with it uh, and do these things themselves very easily. Now with it being OpenShift and OpenShift being a container as a service and a platform as a service, uh, you don't have to dedicate your OpenShift instance to running your JupyterHub notebooks and JupyterHub um, or JupyterHub service. Uh, you can start to deploy other workloads in here. Um, 
one example of this is some work being done uh, through another project um, looked after by Red Hat called Red Analytics. They're doing a lot of work with being able to run Spark clusters inside of OpenShift. So you could potentially in the one OpenShift instance very, very easily deploy a Spark cluster uh, and then people would be using notebooks which uh, run up with JupyterHub, which are communicating with that cluster. But you can basically, anything you can run inside a container, you can get started running inside of OpenShift. And, and so this becomes a shared resource uh, for you to use, um, and not just amongst yourselves, but with other people in the organization as well, which means that you, it's not dedicated infrastructure. You can share infrastructure costs uh, and make better, better utilization of the resources for the company. Um, and as I said, all you, you can do whatever you want as long as you've got the quotas and limits on what you need to do. And of course, all this is open source. Um, so you can get down OpenShift Orange, you can install it yourself uh, and do it that way. Uh, or if you are interested in the uh, support from Red Hat, you can get OpenShift Container Platform for a Red Hat subscription. Um, and so finally, um, at the moment, the where I'm, I'm playing around with all this and my repositories for it, they are up on uh, GitHub in a organization called Jupyter on OpenShift. Uh, so if you are interested in that, you can go there. Uh, I have posted various blog posts on the OpenShift blog about getting Jupyter running in OpenShift, and I'm for sure we'll be doing more. Uh, and as far as this briefing, uh, you can find um, a more, lot more than this uh, as, as part of OpenShift Commons as well. Diane's been organizing a lot of different people coming in and talking about a lot of different things to do with uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence and so on. Uh, so this will go up in there uh, as well, but there are a bunch of other talks as well. And you can find uh, various of those on the common site, or you can actually go off to our OpenShift blog as well and look through the tag for machine learning and you'll find them all linked off there. And finally there, you also see the uh, RAD Analytics um, project and the URL for that. And that's, that is uh, providing a lot of things for machine learning. Um, I don't know everything they're providing, but there's various bits and pieces in there for using Spark, um, but also different ways of deploying Jupyter Notebooks as a means of uh, visualizing the data from that as well. And so that's about it. Um, great, so great, job. It great job, Graham. I think that um, was, was really um, a, a great tour de force on all things Jupyter related. And, and you really do see that there's lots of different options for this. What we're seeing in the OpenShift Commons is folks from both the EDU side of things, the education, the universities, um, and um, on enterprises that are doing um, interesting things with machine learning um, and AI and all kinds of fun stuff, um, as well as um, all of our old friends from the Python communities and the SciPy and NumPy folks um, using Jupyter stuff. So it, it'll be interesting to see the evolution of Jupyter Hub. Um, I had a, a quick question because I know we talked. You talked about deploying this on um, your own OpenShift um, or OpenShift Origin or on OCP. Um, are there any limitations to running this on OpenShift Online or OpenShift Dedicated? Um, yeah, OpenShift Online. Uh, you're not going to have sufficient resources in the starter tiers. Uh, it is possible to get a single Jupyter Notebook instance up, but they they tend to be very memory hungry when you start to actually work with your own notebooks and data. Uh, so the starter tier, not quite enough resources. It's, it's useful to just spin it up, try it out. Um, but uh, yeah, if you're gonna do any serious work, you're probably gonna need more resources than that provide. That's where the pro tier comes in. Um, and you can, you can get this up and running on uh, pro tier, uh, although I put a little caveat on that, there's a, Funny little configuration mistake in uh, the pro tier at the moment, which I've been trying to get fixed because uh, it causes a little bit of a problem. Uh, and so it's not quite so simple to get them up and running, um, but well, I'm working on getting that fixed. But yes, you can run it in pro. Uh, so technically, if you have the resources in there, you could run this and run a small JupyterHub cluster for a small group of people and get up and running there. Um, mm -hmm. Now, one comment you made about the, the future of JupyterHub, uh, I, I have it disabled, but one of the things actually is, is quite exciting in the Jupyter space at the moment is that they are overhauling the web interface for Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, so they've got this uh, uh, project coming along called Jupyter Lab, uh, which totally overhauls the, the web interface for Jupyter Notebooks such that you aren't restricted any longer for having a single notebook on a page at a time. Uh, you can have multiple notebooks and in a tabbed environment within the actual user interface. I have had that running and it looks quite interesting, but uh, I disabled it at the moment 
Um, but that's a quite interesting thing that's coming along with Jupyter Notebooks, but it does work as well. So, so the, um, the interesting thing to me, and it's just been the, the paid Jupyter Hub things that are on, that's on Microsoft Azure or the data lab on um, Google's cloud, um, would it be possible for someone just to take um, the work that you've done and convert that into um, their own uh, Jupyter Hub offering? I mean, it seems doable, um, and you could just customize it. That you know, if someone were, were so so wanting to create their own version of Data Lab, is that something that people might do, or a university might do for themselves? Uh, the Jupyter Hub software is quite configurable, uh, so. I didn't, I didn't in my demo have a, a thing with authentication, but you can also put in your own authentication system. So you might have to construct a little bit of a web interface separately for your actually signing up and uh, creating it. Uh, but you can have SSO hooked into JupyterHub so that if you're already logged in via this separate system first, then the SSO works. So as soon as you go to JupyterHub instance, then it'll fire your notebook. So there's no reason why this can't be used as a base for creating your own little mini service internally to your organization, or if you actually do want to do something which have a more commercial basis. Yeah, so I'm going to look to see, because I, I, I think I've, I've gotten a few folks, um, especially from the EDU side, and then some of the folks in the financial services side of things that have been um, quite interested in, in doing something with JupyterHub and they may have already done it on their own um, without using OpenShift under the hood. But um, what was interesting to me was really describing it as you can have Jupyter Hub and then you can do your other workloads too on OpenShift. And I know these folks all have OpenShift already running. So it'll, um, I'll be interested to see. There goes the dog. That must be the alarm clock. For ending, <laughs> ending this session on. Hang on a second while I quiet him down. I had I had a question. Well, um, I'm seeing in the market there's a lot of a lot of kind of data, big you know big data analytics without the data scientist, and they know that they can't do it. They can't do the big stuff without data science, but they don't want to have to call a data scientist in every time they want to do a, a model. This seems like it would be something to put in the toolkit for that. You know, could you build up a, a reasonable data analytics piece without uh, you who's more into the, understands the business than the, the data analytics part. Um, if I understand where the question's coming from, you're chop, dropping in a bit out, so I didn't quite get all of it. The, the intent of, of oh, I'm what sorry. I'm doing oh. here is to provide a way of doing things in OpenShift where you have much, much control, more control over how you're doing things compared to say a software as a service. The idea that you can run additional workloads in there to support what you're doing and customize it. And this is where you can bring in that RAD Analytics project or any other project which is providing the sort of capabilities you need and using it in conjunction with this. So I'm, I'm viewing it as like a toolkit approach uh, as opposed to a software as a service where it's locked down and works only a particular way. So I think that whole approach to things is sort of satisfying what you think you're talking about because you can start to add in these extra bits which have that better domain knowledge of, of what you need to do. Yeah, I think. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah, I think Rob, that, that's one of the beauties of Jupyter Notebooks is that you could create something that's specific to a business organization, Jupyter Notebook, and share it amongst them, and they could tweak it or add add things into it and make it, um, you know, that company's uh, data analytics notebook or whatever their data source is, and have all the hooks and bells and whistles into that shared Jupyter Notebook, and then they could customize it and share it. Um, and tweak it out. And that, that's really one of the, the wonderful things about Jupyter Notebooks. And then Jupyter Hub lets them collaborate on these things. So uh, it's it's a really wonderful platform. It's been really taken advantage of a lot by um, folks in um, academia um, and and folks at, in Ber I think it came out of Berkeley originally, but now 
it's been adopted pretty widely in the FSI and industry um, as well. So um, it's caught on, and I, I think as an open source project, it's, it's getting a lot of um, attention these days. The scenario I always like to target is the idea that a manager could come in in the morning, just go to a, a particular URL, and they get a new custom notebook for that day, which mm -hmm. has been generated overnight um, and customized based on business data that may have been produced the previous day. And they don't have to know how to deploy anything. Uh, all the system can be automated behind the covers by using the functionality of OpenShift with jobs to fire off tasks overnight to build new notebooks or new sets of data. And they just come in and it's there for them as soon as they log in and they don't have to worry about it. There's some pretty cool use cases. So um, I hope to get some of the folks um, in the different industry sectors to, to showcase what they're doing with Jupyter and, and um, share their, their best practices too. So hopefully we'll have a few more follow-ons with this as well as bring in the RAD Analytics folks and get them to show off some of what they're doing as well. There's been a whole bunch of um, talks on Spark, on TensorFlow, um, and using Jupyter Notebooks to, to analyze data with those. There's tons more coming There's a new project um, and community developing around Kubernetes and machine learning. Um, that's what that machine learning special interest group's all about. Um, so there's lots more to come. So thank you very much, Graham, for um, taking the time to do this, um, this session. I'm sure people will find it useful. I'll post it up on blog.openshift.org, um, dot com rather, with the slides um, shortly. And um, we are going to have our first machine learning special interest group, I think, January 19th. So if people are interested in joining that, um, click on the list below and I'm sure Jupyter Hub will come up in those conversations as well. So thanks again, Graham, and uh, we'll talk to you all soon.